Greetings, greetings, and a warm welcome to absolutely everyone joining us on this call. Salibonani, Linjani, Makadiko, Bonjour, from whichever part of our beautiful globe you are calling in from. It's an honor and a privilege to host you today for this convening, which will be tackling the issue of health in Africa from a decolonial perspective. My name is Tanya Charles the host of this convening today. I'm hailing from Zimbabwe, but I'm currently seated in a very gray Oxford, which is raining in the UK. I'm representing the Atlantic Institute, a body which supports the work of leaders across the world who are working to tackle social injustice. It's one of the co-partners of this event, together with Kekano, which hosts the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity in South Africa, as well as HSG Global, Chesai, the University of Wits, who have come together to really support what is a timely and urgent project where we will be examining health systems in Africa. I'm so excited to introduce the co-conveners who have for months, and when I say months, I mean many months, maybe even a year, been working to put the spotlight on this critical conversation focused on decoloniality and African health. The two co-conveners are Shanaz and Lance, Shanaz Munsi and Lance Luskita. Lance is a PhD candidate in health systems and policy at the School of Public Health and Medicine at the University of Cape Town. He's a health systems and policy research scholar, a career activist, and a senior Atlantic fellow for health equity in South Africa, hosted by Takano. And I'd invite you to take a look at the programs there. Their PhD explores health systems responsiveness to queer users in primary healthcare settings. And this is the current focus of their work, among many others. I'm also really excited to introduce the second co-convener, Shanaz Munshi. She is the research project manager of the WITS Sheham Research Program on Health Inequality and the Social Determinants of Health. She is also a senior Atlantic fellow for health equity and an activist researcher with a particular interest in feminist decolonial scholarship and practice. She has also been an occupational therapist for 10 years, servicing vulnerable and marginalized communities in South Africa and in the UK. It's been an honor to work with both of you over the course of these last few months. I know your passion and your heart lies in transforming health systems in Africa so that they are people-centered and responsive and centering our own solutions. I hand over now to Lance to officially open this amazing event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Greetings, everyone. I would like to invite us all to just start with a deep breath. As the breathing brings us into proximity with each other, and as the world's attention has been brought to breath, we warmly welcome you to this gathering as the conveners, a space of conversation that seeks to grapple with the intersections between decoloniality and African health systems. For us, decolonial thinking is a segue to advancing responsive and socially just health systems on the continent. This project was inspired by the roads and fees must fall, African intersectional feminist and queer movements in our respective institutions and communities that we are part of and represent. The breathlessness, gasping for air and urgency to breathe of these movements flow within us. We thus situate ourselves in the broad history and locate us in connection to historical thinkers and contemporary thinkers, practitioners and advocates interested in doing decolonial work on the continent. Our lungs expanded with fresh air upon hearing about the themes of the health systems global and the intentions to curate and generate conversations, taking us to the heart of the power of politics, economics, social structures and technologies. We applied to facilitate an organized session at the Health Systems Global Convening that was meant to happen in Dubai in November, but is now happening virtually. And when the HSG Africa Regional Network launched a call for convenings that explicitly calls on decolonizing health systems and policy research as their central theme, our lungs found air and we found bread. We could breathe a little lighter. We had envisioned a gathering with applied transformative pedagogy 
a face-to-face -face space where we can engage and ground ourselves and each other. And that will allow us to have a very reflexive, warm and open conversation where we could connect to the visceral, where we could draw explicitly on our different sense modalities and knowledges. Our bodies can think and feel and change as we nurture deeper consciousness. We had to adapt to the crisis of coronavirus and with the support of the Atlantic Institute, Tecano, the Chesai community and the Witt School of Public Health and many contributions from these communities, we have now created an amazing virtual gathering that allows us to dissipate borders and expand our reach while also recognizing the limitations of gathering virtually, such as that we cannot touch and hug each other, we cannot laugh in the same room or sing and dance and cheer together. And we cannot share meals together. And although we have collaborated with people across the continent to increase participation and inclusivity, we deeply acknowledge that we fall short with representing the diverse languages of the continent that could have facilitated deeper inclusion and participation from many localities and contexts. However, this is a starting point for us and our journey. And we will continue to learn, reflect, and build as we journey along a collective solidarity project on the continent. This is your space. You are part of this gathering. And this is an invitation, a very warm invitation, to journey and breathe with us in a world where breathing has become dangerous and brave. Thank you, Lance. I would like to reiterate this warm welcome to everybody in this virtual room as I take a deep breath and reflect on Lance's invitation to consciousness with our bodies, our minds, our hearts, against the backdrop of the biological, political, technological, economic, and social forces of the world we live in today. So my offering in this opening is to suggest a kind of terms of engagement that will guide the next three days. In this gathering, we observe values beliefs and practices that recognize humanity. Every interaction with each other is seen as an opportunity for knowledge creation and production, useful to read the world in ways that center people's experiences, which can ultimately inform our processes and outputs from this beautiful generative space. It is seen as an opportunity to acknowledge the knowledge that everybody in this room brings to the space as central to our learning principle. We acknowledge that we all bring ourselves in every gathering, our ideas, our expertise, our beliefs, our biases and our prejudices and our vulnerabilities. It's therefore imperative to create a brave and a safe space to share while providing opportunities for critical reflection. In our quest to create the catalytic community within the health system's African network and across other communities, it is encouraged that we recognize differences in values, structures, and diversity and to learn from one another. A catalytic African HPSR community can only be created when we are all authentic and empathetic towards one another. This requires us to come with a very open mind, an open heart, and open arms, ready to give and ready to receive. With that, I would like to invite us to consider some of the exciting post-conference outcomes that we will also like to have post this convening. So we recognize that this convening is the first of many African-centered decolonial conversations on the field of health systems and policy research. And as we move forward, a number of post-convening activities are also planned for the upcoming months. And we hope that you all engage with us in these processes. We will consider future webinars, cross-continental conversations. We're also hoping to have an exciting session at the Health Systems Global Conference that will happen on the 12th of November. And we were hoping to craft a conference statement that will gather all the knowledge and ideas from the session. So with that, I would like to wish us all a powerful, transformative gathering. So Aluta Continua, over to you, Tanya. Thank you so much, Lance and Shanaz, for such a warm welcome, for reminding us to breathe and for keeping our eye on the future as we think through 
the next steps in our journey and conversation around African health systems from a decolonial perspective. It's my pleasure now to warm the place even further with help from a wonderful woman named Philippa Nyamutevi Kabali Kagwa. She is a storyteller, a poet, a coach, and a skilled facilitator with over 20 years of experience. She uses storytelling as a catalyst for community conversations and for teaching as well as for entertainment. At the center of her practice is deep listening, and she responds to all the client-based requests and bespoke solutions for those of us who work in community spaces. Philippa believes that we all need to hear stories and to tell stories and to use stories to shape the world we live in. So Philippa brings that into the space as we recognize different ways of knowing and experiencing. And we are excited now to hand over to Philippa to really warm the room and take us into a deeper connection session. Over to you, Philippa. Good afternoon, everybody. As I said, my role is to really warm the space and to acknowledge that we've started on a journey. And I think for me, the Akan words of Sankofa, they say that when you start on a journey, in order to move forward, sometimes you've got to go back to fetch the things that you need in order to move forward. And that is part of the decolonial journey of going back, taking what we need, acknowledging where we are right now, and of looking to the future. As Africans, we need to acknowledge who we are and where we're coming from. When you walk into a gathering, people ask you, Gwani, Gubani, who are you? And why are you here? When we begin a journey also, we need to know where we are and where we're coming from, and we work with what we have. And so we start with maybe the colonial view of who we are as Africans. And I want us to start with an exercise You have three minutes. Without using Google, without cheating, can you please try and name as many countries as you can on the continent? Because if we are going to talk about Africa, we really do need to know where we're coming from. There are 54 countries. Are you finding them? Are you finding Uganda? Do you know exactly where Sierra Leone is? Do you know where Botswana is? Do you know where Djibouti is? There's a country called Ka, Central African Republic. Sao Tome, did you know? The Gambia. Okay, I'm going to stop you right now. Did anybody get all 54? Ooh, 53, and someone got 42, well done. So one of the invitations to all of you as you embark on this journey is let's get to know our continent in different ways. Another way I would like to introduce you to the continent is we are here in the middle of a pandemic. And in this time, we need to think about the people and the people who are affected by access to or lack of access to health facilities. Do you remember when the Ebola crisis came to the continent? the first one in the DARC. I kept seeing all of these reports and they were all about numbers and they were all about how many people and how many people were getting better and how many people were sick and how many people were dying. And I wondered what it meant for a mother with a child looking after her child. So I wrote this poem and I think it's relevant now as we are in another pandemic. Love in a time of Ebola. I heard your wail ricochet across the land the day they told you your child was gone. For days, you had wiped his sweat-drenched brow, cleaned his vomit, until at last you wrapped him on your back, walked to the hospital, the hot sun testing your strength, your rhythmic movement comforting his ravaged body your voice soothing, reminding him of his name, of who he is, of home, wrapping him in mother love. 
at the hospital you found them, alien clad in masks, overalls, gloves and glasses, healers in a time of Ebola. They wrenched him from your arms, patient number 1029, stripping him of his name. Isolate. The cold metal trolley squeakingly rolled him into a bleach cleaned room that only they could enter. Then they sprayed you clean with bleached water and locked you up for days, quarantine. With only the clothes on your back, you sat. One question, forming and unforming, forming and unforming. How will he heal without a mother's touch? How will he heal without a mother's touch? How will he heal without a mother's touch? You wanted to speak, but the words stuck to your throat, tears carving a valley in your chest so deep you were starting to drown. Your hands burned with a healing love that not even those tears could quench. Then one day they let you out. You asked to see your child. He is gone, Mama. May he rest in peace. You stood still for an eternity. Then you asked if you could wash and dress him one last time. If you could take him home to spend his last night in his father's house. You wanted to send a message home so they could start preparing his resting place. Alien clad, they opened the book and said, he was buried this morning in a special bag with the others. Then they walked you to a field not so near, pointed to a mound of soil marked by a small cross with 1029. The wire around the field held you out. That is when I heard your wail, entreating us to hold you, lest you drown in your own heart. And as each one heard, we sang out a song of mourning while our tears beat a dirge on the dusty ground below and our feet danced the earth soft. As our sister circle grew, the song traveled slow and strong through the earth and just as you fell to the ground, it rested beneath you, holding you, softening the ground on which you lay beaten and lost. We sang and Mother Africa held you to her bosom until the pool of tears welling up within burst open, pouring into the earth and slowly, slowly you stopped drowning. You stood up, you called his name, danced his farewell and walked back home, back empty, carrying the heaviness of this emptiness in your heart. As we engage in these conversations, let us remember that we are doing it not only for ourselves and it is not an intellectual exercise. It is an exercise for the continent. It is reclaiming our ways of knowledge. It is creating or working towards a health system that is equitable, that is accessible to all. It is reminding ourselves that we have knowledge and we are able to do the things that we need to do. As we have conversations, I just want to also say and invite you to remember that all voices are welcome, that there will be difference in opinion, and that's all right. This is a short conversation, the beginning of a very long conversation. And so you don't need to say everything you need to say today. The panel speakers are called firelighters because they are just starting conversations. And so we need to remember that if we take too much time, we might be silencing other people. Share your thinking. It's not a debate, it's a dialogue. We need to understand where you're coming from. Listen with your head and with your heart. Listen to understand. Listen so the other person can hear themselves think. And remember to take the long view. And to close, I want to invoke the elders. This is a poem by Lebo Hang Mashile, and it says, we call on memories buried inside skeletons of the first people to walk the skin of the earth, who nursed and nested in the cradle and spread civilizations across the planet like seeds. 
Tell us of the air that flows through the heart of the land to all life and creation. Tell us of breath, the first song. Tell us of words like constellations, of ideas mapping our contributions to humanity. Tell us of infinity, how the universe lives in us. Tell us which stars bear our names so that we no longer fear the night. Tell us of earth, of roots that course through the body of the land like veins through flesh. Tell us of the force that squeezed red sand like dough to form mountains. Tell us how to make communities strong, like gemstones formed under extreme pressure. We call on the desert to remember when she was the bottom of the sea. Help us to understand to be fluid like water, how to be supple without losing our identity. We call on the volcanoes to inject us with flames of imagination. Once we carried tongues burping fire, we melted metals with our minds. Tell us what we have forgotten. We are not afraid of bones. Tell us what we have lost. We are not afraid of remembering. Tell us what has been erased. We are not afraid of time. Tell us who we once were. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. We are not afraid of ourselves. May this be the beginning of a strong and beautiful and powerful conversation that will change our continent. Aluta continua. Thank you. Aluta and Amandla, thank you so much, Sis Philippa, for that beautiful invocation of our ancestors, of our past, of our present and our future. A reminder that it's not an intellectual project alone, but that we must bring our memory and reclaim the knowledge that exists within us. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure at this juncture in the program to go deeper and introduce the session that has gathered us here today, session one entitled Exploring the Intersection Between Decoloniality and African Health Systems, a conversation in post-colonial Africa, colonial being in quotes, of course. In this session, our amazing input panel will frame the importance of situating a decolonial conversation linked to health systems and policies continentally. The intention, as you would have read in the program, is to build a bridge between the two schools of thought, one being decolonial theory and the other health systems and the policy world. We consider the epistemic crisis that we face in the world and the impact of this crisis on African health and health policy and systems. We also consider that African lives, as we bring back the human and center people, have been impacted by the reality that racism, segregation, and inequality have been invisibly and visibly, as well as pervasively embedded and dominant in cultures and in social institutions across the continent. We explore these dynamics and many others. I'm so excited to introduce the amazing Professor Letitia Rispel, who will be facilitating this session for us. Professor Rispel holds a South African research chair on the health workforce and is Professor of Public Health at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Leticia has occupied senior leadership positions in government and in the academy. Between 2018 and 2020, she served as the president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations, being the first African woman to hold this position. Amazing. Her research interests are human resources for health, quality of care, performance of the healthcare system and the intersection of these with the social determinants of health. Thank you, Professor Rispo, for your support in putting this program together. And it's really, truly an honor to have you as facilitator for this very timely and urgent discussion. Welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Tanya. San Bonani to everyone on this afternoon's conversation. San Bonani, it's of course a Zulu greeting, which means I see you and you see me and we recognize each other's humanity. I want to start off by thanking 
Shanaz, uh, Lance, and a team that's worked incredibly hard to put together this convening. I also want to thank Philippa and Tanya for very powerful and inspirational, as well as deep and moving way that they've introduced the session and that they've introduced the first day of this convening. So Philippa has reminded us of humanity. She's also reminded us of our African ways. And I just want to remind us perhaps that it's not the beginning of a conversation, but I would say it's rather that we're picking up the conversation again that was started by our elders. And I want to remind us of Ngubi Wa Thiongo, a very powerful Kenyan intellectual poet, playwright and author who talked about decolonizing the mind way back in 1986. And of course, on South African soil, somebody who was very intimately involved in the health sector, the late Steve Ban Tubico. I always wonder what would have happened if he was still alive and if he was able to actually take forward some of the powerful ideas that he started when he was alive. What would the shape of the health system have been in South Africa as well as in other African countries? So without further ado, I want to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Faisal Garba, who's a lecturer in the sociology department at the University of Cape Town, and is also affiliated to the Institute for Sociology at the University of Freiburg. Dr. Garba is the co-convener of UCT's Global Studies Program, and he leads the Migration and Inequality Hub in South Africa that examines the intersection of mobility, inequality, and development in the Global South. Dr. Garba's research and teaching interests radiate around African migration, social change, working class history and organization, African historical sociology and social theory. He teaches courses on social theory, society and change, globalization and inequality and introduction to sociology. So over to you, Dr. Garba, and welcome. Thank you very much, moderator, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Now, I do not have a medical background. I'm a sociologist, but I have an interest in the sociology of medicine and sociology of knowledge. I'm very interested in knowledge production in Africa, but also on Africa. So in this presentation, I'll try and do three things quickly. So the first is to very briefly historicize what I call the duality of healthcare in Africa with the advent of colonialism, and then to look at COVID as a case in point, and then try to put forward some ideas going forward. I'm a sociologist, so we love theories. <laughs> so I want to operate from a theoretical framework. This is called the dual public. This is the theoretical framework that I chose. It was put forward by a Nigerian thinker called Peter Ake, who was trying to understand how colonialism cultivated different sentiment, but also different ways of relating to the public sphere. Here, I want to adapt this framework by arguing that colonialism relied on alterity as an important mechanism of rule and control. So you have the racial authority, white, black, the class authority, rich and poor, but you also have gender, you have ethnicity and others. Central to colonialism was the devaluation of knowledges that do not fit its purpose. So often the knowledge of the colonized is considered as incoherent and incapable of systematically addressing any aspect of existence. Accordingly, biomedicine and hospitals were mainly serving colonial administrators, while clinics and smaller health posts were supposed to serve the colonized populace. Most of the colonized, of course, had been staying away from these health posts for a number of reasons, one of which was the combination of the sheer brutality of colonial exploitation, forced labor, and the connection between forms of health delivery and forms of colonial rule in terms of extraction of taxes in certain colonies in Africa. This duality brought about a class dimension which was manifested in education. So under colonialism, of course, the earliest locally trained healthcare practitioners were trained in schools that had a particular notion of who had value and who did not have value. So the localized educated natives, as they were called, imbibed a particular class outlook that viewed ordinary people as lacking knowledge, as ignorant. 
Accordingly, apart from attempts in certain parts of Africa, the language of healthcare remained alienating for many ordinary people. And that became the mainstream notion of what it means to access healthcare in language that was easily not accessible to ordinary people. Across the African continent, some states in the immediate post-colonial period attempted to solve the question of access by instituting integrated healthcare systems that try to draw on diverse theories, but also diverse understanding of the body and diverse notions of healthcare. Now, this attempt quickly unraveled by the 1970s with the emergence of structural adjustment programs called SAPs, which really brought about the collapse of healthcare systems across the African continent through the introduction of what is known as cash and carry in certain parts of Africa or full cost recovery. The attempt at integrated healthcare systems was abandoned by states that were more interested in making sure that they were able to recover full costs. This lack of attention meant that by the late 1990s, many healthcare systems in Africa were simply incapable of taking care of the majority of the people who had become impoverished. So that a class dimension intensified in terms of the kinds of healthcare that people could access, but also in terms of how integrated other ways of knowing where to what became mainstream healthcare systems. Here, I think this duality is very much linked with the way in which colonialism has subsumed African ways of knowing, but also African societies as a peripheral part of the global political economy. Here, I want to focus briefly on COVID and the coverage around COVID, but also the ways in which communities across Africa have attempted to cope with COVID. Now, most of us here might have seen that BBC Africa headline, which says that people are not dying in droves in Africa because of poverty. The crux of the story is simply that people in townships, in shanty towns in Africa, are used to very debilitating social conditions, that their bodies have become adjusted to diseases, so COVID was unable to do anything to them. But what nobody asked, because the reporter said he spoke to a number of public health practitioners and epidemiologists who were completely bemused by this situation. What nobody asked is the history and knowledge of past pandemics and their containment that communities have gathered and utilized in the present moment. So what ideas about diseases enabled people to withstand Ebola, for example? What is it about knowledge of antivirals and immune systems that could help us to understand the reason why Africa completely disproved the diagnosis of people dying in droves on the streets? If we take Sierra Leone, which was one of the hard-hit countries by Ebola, communities developed localized lockdowns against Ebola that ensured a devolved centralized decision-making process emerge where decisions are made around who could move, At what time, where can people be isolated? And that was very much done in connection with local healthcare practitioners, community healthcare nurses, such that it became possible for villages that were neighboring other countries to serve as buffer zones against the exportation of Ebola to other parts of West Africa. None of these questions were raised. And I think if we had an understanding of healthcare that took seriously the knowledge of people that understood the history of people dealing with pandemics like the current one, we would have a completely different picture as opposed to the sensationalist image that was put out by the BBC. Now, going forward, I think a number of questions come to mind. The first is, any notion of decolonization, I think, must privilege plurality and the question of political economy. Because the idea of devalorizing knowledge the idea of subjugating certain ways of knowing is very much linked to the extraction of profits, is very much linked to the production and reproduction of inequality. Such that knowledge is actually a tool in the furtherance of this disempowerment that ordinary people face across the continent. Accordingly, research and advocacy, I think, has to expand publicly funded universal healthcare Such an agenda will have ripple effects in society as the commercialization of healthcare is linked with the privatization of public goods from education to land and now 
who knows, maybe air with COVID because oxygen is the main thing. If you can have a technology that will trap clean oxygen in a box, you can commercialize it and sell it. So the point I'm trying to make is that understanding the nexus between a decolonial agenda and healthcare on the African continent has to see the centrality of publicly funded healthcare to challenging the core or the enduring legacy of colonialism at the epistemic level, which is this division between what is called knowledge housed in the academy, in the dominant Western paradigms, and what is called stupidity supposedly housed in society. So the point I want to really emphasize this point, that access to publicly funded healthcare, meaning decommodifying healthcare, is a central struggle against the endurance of colonialism today. Because healthcare, in a sense, determines who can live and who cannot live. But that is also linked to who can have access to certain ways of knowing and who cannot have access to those ways of knowing, who can have access to land and who cannot have access to land. Finally, I want to emphasize the need to take seriously a continental approach, one, at the level of research, two, at the level of thinking seriously about concepts and categories that define ideas of health and ideas of ill health. And finally, that researchers have to really see our role as one which is not just about regurgitating frameworks, but about developing alternatives that are rooted in local material conditions and everyday life. So thank you very much. I will stop here now. Thank you so much for that very insightful presentation. I'm going to move to the next speaker and then right at the end, I'll give you my take of what are the key learnings for me. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, Professor Ramugondo, who's the Deputy Dean for Postgraduate Education at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Cape Town, where she studied both for her undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications. She served as an occupational therapist in rural South Africa, where she pioneered the first occupational therapy department at Silizini Special School in Limpopo province. Professor Ramagondo's work over the past two decades has combined transformational leadership and excellence in research and teaching as interdependent and interlinked concepts, ensuring responsiveness to the local context within a globally competitive reality. Professor Ramugondo has played a seminal role in transformation efforts at UCT and in advancing the discourse on decoloniality, the theory, as well as praxis in the health sciences. We're looking forward to your input. Over to you, Professor Ramugondo. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Professor Rispal, and thank you to the team. It's been very nice to see familiar faces. I'm quite delighted that what has been said already touches on some of the things that I was going to say to start with my input. But I will start at the point that the previous speaker has also alluded to, that concepts are important. <laughs> And we need to pay attention to what they mean and try as much as possible to be honest in how we engage with concepts that particularly make us uncomfortable, pretty much what decoloniality often is to many people. And I think in line with what Prof has already indicated, decoloniality is not a new conversation currently. But I think what is important to signal is that what has been different in the current conversations around decolonization, reinvigorated by the Rosemus Four movement at UCT, has been one, the global nature of the conversation, and two, the theorization that has emerged, mostly led by Latin American decolonial scholars. This theorization is important. It is important because of four key points that I will mention. One, that when decoloniality is understood from the framework of coloniality as clearly defined by Kigano, drawing from Latin American activists and scholars, it becomes very difficult to speak about the post-colonial era because coloniality by its nature persists even beyond the withdrawal of colonial administrators. 
So already decoloniality as a concept disrupts the notion of post-colonial Africa. Secondly, what decoloniality does and the theorization around it is that it allows for resonance as part of meaning making within the academy. If we accept that the academy should be a space for profound meaning making for both academics and students and for contestation of ideas that intersect with lived realities, then we should not be surprised that there has been such a huge uptake of the current decolonial term. This is mainly because a lot of what is raised and conjured up in the imagination around words, concepts in relation to decoloniality speaks so directly to deepening inequality. The Black Lives Matter movement reminds us that a lot of what we see as perpetual oppression on the continent also follows those in the diaspora with North America presenting itself as a site for rupture. And we have not seen this in the first instance only with the brutal killing of George Floyd, but all moments of rupture when a killing, a brutal killing occurs. And what has always been worrying is that those killings very much mirror what we also see in South Africa, the brutal murders at the hands of the police. COVID-19, as has already been indicated, is again another reminder that these deep inequalities that persist have serious consequences for health for the marginalized. So when we talk about decoloniality and we allow those who continue to be marginalized to speak on their own behalf, we begin to imagine what knowledge could look like if produced from the perspectives of the colonized. And this is where often a lot of tension happens because there's always the urge to take over the conversation, take over the narrative in complete fashion with what Western domination is about. No space for different voices to center themselves, even when what they are theorizing about, what they are trying to make meaning of is their lives. Thirdly, what is important about the theorization around decoloniality is that decoloniality cannot just mean anything. What our Latin American decolonial scholars have done is signify clear terrains of thinking around coloniality and decoloniality that get us to think about power, knowledges, being, and work that we've done from UCT through the Curriculum Change Working Group has added a third notion doing, which draws from my own work, which came up with the notion occupational consciousness, drawing from Biko, Fanon, and Dassault. And basically not wanting to be swayed from an understanding of consciousness in the way that was understood by all these three individuals, Fanon, Biko, and Enrique Dussel, saying consciousness is both a mental attitude, but also a commitment to fight, a commitment to fight all systems that aim to subjugate on the basis of identity markers. Fourthly, what theorizing about decoloniality offers us is that it unmasks racism. It begins to expose the lie around racism understood only at a relational level where racism needs to be understood as systemic, structural, and institutional. In this regard, Ramon Grossvogel offers a very poignant and important definition of racism, where he sees it as a global hierarchy of superiority and inferiority along the line of the human that has been politically, culturally, and economically produced and reproduced for centuries by the institutions of the capitalist, patriarchal, Western-centric, Christian-centric, modern colonial world system, such that above the line of the human exist those whom the system recognizes as fully human, using identity markers linked to white supremacy, such that in that zone of being, there can only be hyperhumanization, while below the line of the human, or the zone of non-being, 
premature death is often reality. So we have to understand racism as ultimately genocidal. First Nations people all over the world can tell you about how over generations you see the wiping out of whole communities, whole groups of people. And the anti-black racism that came very brutally forth when again George Floyd became that reminder, a virtual reminder for the global community to see how the proverbial neck stifles breathing leading to death. And from what the previous speaker has said, affordability in healthcare for many becomes that proverbial neck. In this regard, I want to end off with the offering from Denis Raphael, who in analyzing failures in advancing health promotion globally, found it useful. And I certainly agree with what he's found when he conducted a discourse analysis of health promotion approaches that have been followed globally and pretty much identified three broad approaches that are used functional, analytical, and structural. With the functional approaches always focusing on the needy. So a lot of effort that goes into identifying those with modifiable medical and behavioral behaviors and pretty much often blaming the victim for their ill health condition. Analytical in the sense that we begin to recognize that material living conditions do lead to ill health, and that oftentimes we can pretty much track ill health alongside group membership. So again, saying people who are marginalized all over the world seem to share certain identity markers, and that cannot be simply ignored. And the third discourse on social determinants of health, which is very important for our discussion today, is the structural one where we begin to recognize the role of public policy decisions, economic and political structures that determine social determinants of health. And here is where we reckon with the fact that social determinants of health and their distribution result from economic and political structures and justifying ideologies. So finding that social democratic states such as Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Finland outperform liberal economies such as the USA, UK, Canada, and Ireland on several health and quality of life indicators. This happens because often there's a pandering to the sensibilities of the central institution, that is the market, liberal political economies, such that we avoid interventionist approaches towards public policy, even in the face of rising adverse social determinants of health. In concluding, this is also indicating that the social determinants of health and their distribution result from the power and influence of those who create and benefit from health and social inequalities. These individuals and groups, usually as part of the corporate sector and wealthy communities, lobby governments and the political elite to advance their own interests, leading to reduced quality of social determinants of health that others are exposed to or a skewed distribution of this. And we've certainly seen how there were efforts to co-opt many of us to push agendas that are really about those that make money on the back of ill health, including the tobacco industry in the context of COVID-19 recently. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not even going to begin to summarize, but certainly a great talk. And I just want to say to Lance and Shanaz, you were promising webinars and clearly both Dr. Gaba as well as Professor Ramogondo could have spoken for the entire afternoon. So there's your first hint that your webinars should be to actually deepen this conversation and to bring them back. So I'm going to move on and introduce our third speaker. Hannah Mutoni Ryder. She's an economist and a former diplomat. Hannah's understanding of international relations was honed as one of the youngest negotiators for the UK in climate change talks. With close to 20 years of experience, she's also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic International Studies, and she sits on the executive board of the British Chamber of Commerce in China. 
Welcome, Hannah, and we look forward to you continuing the conversation. Over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished fellow fire starters. I've been nodding all along. Thank you also so much to HSD, the Atlantic Fellows, and all of the other partners for bringing together this discussion and what I can see is a really fantastically engaged audience that we have here. Thank you also, Professor Rispo, for the excellent moderation. I realize I only have a short time for our fire starter. So let me launch straight into the three key practical points that I would like to bring to our discussion. And I think the practical is what I can really add to this discussion. Sometimes it's easy to think and feel that colonialism is in the past. What my fellow fire starters, I think, have already shown is that it clearly isn't. But what I'm here to do, I hope, is share some thoughts on how the white gaze still affects the development sector and also, in particular, the global health sector in very practical ways. I'm trained as an economist, but I've always been a policymaker focused on how we can shift structures for the benefit of Africa in particular. So three points. First, COVID-19 crisis is exposing the world's vulnerabilities. Most of us would not be here if we didn't believe that the world needs to be a better place. But the fact is that the structures that we have are clearly not fit for purpose. And of course, many of us knew this before COVID-19. Look at climate change. I can personally attest to the numbers of sleepless nights spent by negotiators trying to move ahead. But we're still not doing what our children demand of us. The World Trade Organization, arguably the strongest international legal mechanism there is, and who might possibly have an African women leader soon. But it's been unable to drive trade to Africa above 2% of the global total. At the same time, the US and China have waged a trade war, which continues as fiercely as the pandemic does. In the aid world, loans, even the supposed large loans from China, have not been enough to build the needed health systems or infrastructure in African countries and beyond. Yet, the IMF classifies many countries as debt distressed. When it comes to health, the world has collectively been spending billions on health, but that spending has hardly been the driver for any successes so far in the COVID-19 fight. Indeed, it has been that special word intervention, which has been most crucial, but that is kept out of the narrative. Look at the billions that are spent on HIV AIDS medicines every year, which many aid organizations are very keen to champion and discuss, but thousands still die every year. What hope can we possibly have from COVID-19 vaccines, given this experience? There are many, many structural problems with the world, and what COVID-19 is doing is it is exposing them. Second, COVID-19 is exposing some important opportunities. Opportunities to think about Black Lives Matter, to talk about decolonization in a real way. Opportunities to see what our world looks like without huge power and transport emissions. Opportunities to compare what African and Asian governments have done compared to the rest of the world and look at those with new eyes and wonder have the investors and credit agencies got our risk assessments wrong when they think about foreign direct investment. We can think about the opportunities to use digital tools to expand education to help poorest children. We can see how important and useful those digital tools can be. How could we, as I recently proposed, use lessons from microfinance to inform our multilateral discussions about debt? And when it comes to health funds, is there an opportunity for these public health funds, such as Gavi and even China's inputted oriented aid, to be oriented more towards system strengthening? And what does that actually look like? We must realize that even though we're seeing lots of structural problems, we also have opportunities. This is as exciting a time as it is a difficult time. Third, and perhaps most importantly, coming from these two observations and being a fire starter, those of us in the virtual room today have a responsibility. We have to question, think out of, reimagine, as the consultancy that I've built is called, the current structures. 
even if that feels uncomfortable. Earlier this year, I wrote a piece called A Blueprint for Black Lives Matter in the Development Sector. That piece recognized that reports of serious harassment and discrimination in some of the world's largest health and humanitarian aid organizations continue to emerge on various media outlets. The narrative of expected failure, again, one of my fellow Firestarters mentioned this, the narrative of expected failure in terms of Africa's COVID-19 response has been exposed as racist, as have several explanatory factors, or so-called explanatory factors, such as Africa being disease-ridden or poverty-stricken as the causal factors for low numbers of cases. Testing and vaccine development and distribution is being politicized. At the same time, what we don't talk about is the fact that African knowledge and intellectual property today, even in the health sector, remains underinvested and essentially exploited. Even the UN itself is stuck in structures that were created when the vast majority of African countries were colonies. And those structures have still not changed today. Even Bandung, celebrated South-South principles, which are a core part of my work at the consultancy in China, even Bandung principles were constrained in this respect. Some of the newest principles which are embodied into the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, for instance, universality and country ownership came into the agenda, but they are the most difficult challenges to make real in the sector because development and other agencies continue to tie health products to their own country's priorities, not the needs of the local poor. They continue to look at those development issues as problems over there and not problems here. They look at them and not us. They're not we. So to come to a conclusion, being together, being us, being we, let us be innovative my consultancy is about to launch a new project that will, amongst other things, aim to gather evidence of the challenges in the global health sector, both in terms of prejudice and power, in a more systematic manner than it's been done before, as well as aim to gather wide views on clear, practical ideas for the global health sector going forwards to decolonize, to become more locally owned and less subject to the white gaze. I hope that today we can come up with some of these and find ways to bring them to the forefront of the sector. So with that, with a reminder of our vulnerabilities, the opportunities and our responsibilities, I look forward to taking part and seeing the results of this important dialogue. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Hannah. I'm going to move to our fourth speaker, Dr. Jean-Paul Dussault currently a PhD candidate at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp in Belgium, and is also attached to the Research Center in Human Reproduction and Demography in Cotonou, Benin. He has extensive experience of working in sexual and reproductive health, health policy analysis, disease control, as well as policy development and research. He's also been a passionate advocate for universal health coverage. Over to you, Dr. Dussault. I started being interested a lot by this issue when I started thinking about the way my mother used knowledge and tried to give me the best education she was able to share with me, even though she never went to school and she cannot read any form of book coming from Europe. But my mother do have a lot of knowledge. She do have a lot of skills and capacities that she acquired through a certain structure of knowledge, generation and dissemination, since she practiced a traditional religion that is well spread in West Africa. And in this religious system, knowledge have a place. And there are a lot of systems and practices that aim at generating and using knowledge. Then I started being very interested about what the knowledge of my mother means as compared to the one I learned from school and how both operate together to determine who I am. I think this kind of discussion can be extended to the health system and in a very strong way. 
The best way I try today to solve that conflict in my mind is to use a little bit the iceberg model. The iceberg model locates four layers of reality, I will say. The first one being the one of events, and underneath the one of observable behaviors, the pattern of behaviors. And then under that, you have the underlying systematic structure. And those are the structural forces at play that contribute to the generation of the patterns that you see before the structures. And under the structure, you have mental models. What is about our thinking that create the systems and support them persisting? I fundamentally think today that the issue of coloniality can be conceptualized by thinking about how coloniality in essence means creating mental models that shape the structures of people. And by doing that, you force them to think in that way, in a specific way, you force them to behave and to be subject of events that are grounded in mental models that they do not choose, but that you impose to them. From that perspective, coloniality and the issue of decoloniality become more universal, as colonialism can be considered as one way new and the other mental models have been forced into Africa or into other places in the world. But at the same moment, we can think even today, if it is not colonialism, what are the other kind of forces that are forcing models and that are mental models that structure the way we think and the way we behave today, even beyond the European colonialism we can think about when we think about Africa. I can give this the concrete example of how, for instance, WHO and all the models in which WHO think and act today as a global leader in the field of health is independent from financial forces, uh, digital forces, or media forces, how independent uh, this organization and the mental models of this organization is now free of influences that are not forced by organizations that we know or entities that we know or not. From that perspective, that strongly locates the issue of decoloniality as a universal concern. We can think about the specificity it has for health-related issues in Africa, and in West Africa particularly, and in Benin, where I work and conduct a set of research on sexual and reproductive health today, there are key elements that I want to highlight. The first one for us relates, for instance, to the simple issue of access to family planning. Access to family planning is about, has a lot of layers of phenomenon and of factors that start from what is a human being, what I am, and what is a human being, and how this can be affected by medicines or external practice, and the way traditionally or before colonization, for instance, this issue of the value of life is framed, and the way contraception and the family planning practices are framed from global level. The mental models that support that policies can have a lot of influence on uh, the adoption and the utilization of family planning and the success of the family planning programs in West Africa and particularly in Benin. And beyond that, we can also look at the specific role, for instance, of spirituality. There is the concept of spirituality and the strong power spirits are perceived to have in etiology of disease in Africa, for instance, is something that is not at all considered in works we use to try to understand diseases and to try to understand behaviors, also make policy. However, in mental models in which traditional practices are grounded in Africa, spirituality do play a role and is still playing a lot of role. The coloniality can have a powerful influence on health system by helping us 
to open the discussion on those forgotten dimensions that are having tremendous effect on policies we try to implement for better health and better lives in Africa and beyond. Thank you very much. Jean Paul, thank you so much. Let me introduce our last but not least speaker, Shanaz Munshi, who is the research project manager of the Bits Shyam Research Program on Health Inequality and the Social Determinants of Health. Shanaz is also a senior Atlantic fellow for health equity. She's an activist researcher with a particular interest in feminist decolonial scholarship and praxis. Shanaz is also an occupational therapist with 10 years of experience serving vulnerable and marginalized communities, both in South Africa and in the United Kingdom. Shanaz, as you've heard already, together with Lance, have been the two drivers of this convening this afternoon. Over to you, Shanaz. Thank you so much. I would like to begin by thanking all the speakers for raising such exciting points for us to think about. I plan to do the same, raising ways of thinking. First, I'd like to problematize the health system and begin by saying, why is this conversation so important for us as we were thinking through from the beginning of our journey to where we are now? The thing that troubles us most is this recognition that health systems on the continent are not really responsive to the needs of African people. And they're not actually socially just in their design. And we need to look beyond the obvious system level factors, such as leadership issues, corruption. We have human resource shortages, the brain drain, poor primary health care or comprehensive primary health care systems. We need to look towards the recognition that perhaps our health systems are social determinants and that they are structurally violent places. And the complex social arrangement in which the health system exists, they put individuals and populations in harm's way. So anti-blackness, racism, segregation, economic inequality, climate destruction, gender inequality have all been invisibly and pervasively embedded in our dominant cultures, political, economic organizations, and our social institutions. And COVID-19 has exposed this very strong association between race, gender, ethnicity, culture, and socioeconomic status and health outcomes. We've seen this in the number of deaths occurring amongst Black people in the U.S. and in the U.K. So it's not only Africa that's at risk, but these are really the forms of structural violence that we are talking about. And we need to acknowledge that structural violence is avoidable in the world if the powers that be decide to shift the power and bring about greater equality. So we need to draw our attention to the forces that are embedded in long-standing ubiquitous social structures, those that are normalized by stable institutions and as what Njabulo and Debele says, the everyday experiences. They seem so ordinary in the ways in which we understand our lives that they're invisible and they're normalized and they're unnoticeable. For example, we've become so used to the disparate access to health care, to resources, to political power, to education, and to legal care. Other examples relate to the experiences that play out in some of the most humiliating ways women experience maternity wards, or the humiliation of being refused health care because you can't afford to pay for the private or the public costs. We see these as structurally violent and they link to social injustices and they form part of the machinery of oppression. So perhaps we need to be more angry about these realities that are so normalized. Perhaps we shouldn't say them as if they're just fact and normal and we need to be a bit angrier about them. So on top of this, the very policies that are developed to address these injustices, they fall short. So without intentionally doing so, they make things worse or they perpetuate. And this is because the arrangements of the health systems within governments are built within the project of modernity or capitalism, where the decisions that are made within health systems maintain power where they are. They are not pro-poor. In other words, the policies are not transformative because they exist within systems that are not transformed. Instead, they exist in market-driven systems which leads to women, mostly Black women, mostly Black African women, doing unpaid care work 
And what our speakers today, Faisal Garba, Prof. Elawani, have all asked us to examine who has access to publicly funded healthcare and why is healthcare commodified? What do we do about the social and structural determinants of health, the drivers of the deep seated inequalities that exist? So we ask the question how do we think about the intersection between policies and systems, and how do we transform both policies and systems? The second intervention I want to make is what can decoloniality and intersectional feminist lens offer those of us interested in improving health through research, healthcare, health systems and policy research, global health, epidemiology, health economics. Before I go there, I need to foreground that for us in this project, the decolonial project puts the needs of the disenfranchised or the marginal first those people whom HPSR or global health researchers claim to represent. So we need to start by acknowledging that HPSR and global health are powerful places to start the conversation because these fields are already developing tools to confront and disrupt power. Health scholars across the globe are starting to examine the symbols, such as in the UN institutions, the symbols that exist in our report writing, in our funding models and so forth, as well as the language and the tools that lock us into coloniality. Are we talking about health systems or are we talking about systems of health? Decolonial theory offers us as researchers an opportunity to take that step further, to deconstruct, delink, rupture, and embrace what Latin American scholar Maldonado Torres talks about as the decolonial turn. To do that, HPSR scholars need to take seriously the invitation to deepen our consciousness. In solidarity with each other across the continent, we need to collectively step back and reflect. So what do we need to reflect on? Decoloniality offers us the lens to reflect on the epistemic racism and sexism that is foundational in the knowledge structures of the westernized university. We need to step back and reflect on the canon that forms the foundation of European universities, but also the African universities, as the Rhodes Must Fall movement in South Africa had brought into sharp focus. We need to recognize the epistemic privilege of the westernized man in the westernized university structure of knowledge. As an occupational therapist, I was trained in an African university on a model of assessment that alienated both me and those that I worked with. It allows us to recognize the erasure of our collective history through the epistemicides, which is the destruction of knowledge of African people, language, cultures, libraries, a sad event that we actually need to mourn. It allows us to acknowledge the processes of othering and alienation. For example, the knowledges of Egypt that have been mythologized through the Western lens, instead of being legitimate knowledges that deserve studying, engaging, grappling with, that perhaps can inform our decisions of policy and systems of health or health systems, whichever way you want to go. It asks us to reflect on the Cartesian philosophy. I think, therefore I am. I heal, therefore I am. I conquer, therefore I am. I make policies, therefore I am. We are asked to reflect on how these oppose the now very cliche, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Abantu, where fundamentally there is no such thing as an individual where our commitment, our responsibility, and the intention to socially just health systems, health equity for all, responsiveness to health systems, means that we need new epistemic approaches, or we need to revive approaches that already exist, that radically oppose the structural violence of the university, of the health system, and of other systems that hold us locked in. As graduates of these westernized universities, decolonial theory allows us to see ourselves as colonized subjects, how we are taught to use the master's tools, to see ourselves as colonial subjects that need to undergo healing, that part of our own histories are erased, how imposter syndrome plays out in us, and how to digest what Prof. Romagundo has said as racism is genocidal. And so as scholars or African researchers, we need to undergo the deep reflexive work to recognize how we ourselves are perpetuating these processes that we try to resist. And it asks us to look at our positionality and to reflect on our own forms of power and how power is relational and how we relate to power. My final point is around thinking about why we need 
this African Solidarity Project. For us, we recognize that one of the most fundamental successes of the colonialism project was that it divided and ruled us. So by the divide and rule process, we don't often look to each other for epistemic ideas, knowledges, experiences, as was brought out through Philippa's beautiful poem in Ebola and the other offerings from Prof. Garba and others. So actually to disrupt coloniality means to build solidarity with each other, to learn about each other on the continent, to learn our languages, to learn our ways and to shift focus, to not get locked in the word decoloniality, which sometimes reifies the very thing we are trying to resist, but to move towards an African future, which is built upon solidarity, built upon rigor of methods, built upon acknowledging Africans' experiences, and to take seriously that it's not an intellectual task, but a visceral embodied journey that we need to embark on. And one that connects us more than just to the intellect, but to our spirit and other ways of producing knowledge, holding knowledge, and recognizing the legitimacy of knowledge holders, not just in spaces of academia or under terminologies of scholarship, but that knowledge holders, knowledge producers are in the community. And as Jean-Paul brought out from his mom. So ultimately, decoloniality offers us a chance to bring back our humanity, perhaps. And it offers us a chance to name and challenge the historical and contemporary political, social, economic forces that have been created and continue to reinforce the current state of African people. And we call out the contradiction in world affairs that although Africa is the repository of the greatest mineral wealth in the world, it is full of poor people. So ultimately, I think for us, it's about shifting away from that which the colonial project decided for us that we should be reimagining where we would like to go. This is the start, and I look forward to the next three days and the ideas that emerge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anas, for bringing together some of the other inputs. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you, to the conveners. Philippa, we started off with a very powerful poetry and um, our participants without whom this session certainly wouldn't have been as successful as it is. So what they have tried to do is to highlight maybe what are the key aspects that I'm the one to reflect on and key learnings from me. So I've tried to incorporate all voices, but as the speaker from Benin reminded us, we also need to recognize our own biases. So sometimes perhaps with somebody else that reflected on today's session, they would have come with a slightly different lens. I think the first point for me was around the relevance, the criticality and the intersection among the current COVID-19, the health inequities and the discourse on decoloniality and health, as well as the health systems. One of our fire lighters reminded us that COVID has exposed the vulnerability not only in our own countries, but also at a global level. The second message from my side is that many of the speakers highlighted that concepts are important, that to some extent post-colonialism is a misnomer because so much of what we're grappling with is actually remnants of that colonial past. And so the notion of coloniality is not in the past, and it's reflected in the devaluation of knowledge and of knowledge systems, the structures, some which happen at a global level, whether it's at the UN as well as WHO, and the disjuncture between health spending and health outcomes. The third message is around the potential of applying a decoloniality lens it's around recognizing the importance of disruption of thinking as well as disruption of consciousness. The speakers reminded us of the thinking that needs to happen in very clear terrains, whether it's around power, knowledge, being, and doing. And Professor Ramagundo reminded us of the notion of occupational consciousness. The fourth message that came through is around the need for us to have explicit mental models and also the importance of reflection and reflexivity. Some of the issues that came out was the importance of recognizing our biases 
there were some suggestions that were made around the importance of us respecting diversity and perhaps not replacing one dominant view with another dominant view, which won't be helpful. What I also found very interesting that Faisal reminded us that the notion of identity or the assignment of identity was a colonial project. And we need to be conscious about that, that the colonial powers were very clear in actually making sure that we recognize our differences rather than our commonalities as Africans. And he highlighted that the notion of Africanicity is a social process and it's neither fixed nor ahistorical. The fifth aspect is around what might a decolonial and socially just health system look like. And again, it's not going to be uniform, but some of the characteristics would be that such a health system would prioritize those that are disempowered. It would acknowledge the knowledge of people, especially those people who are not privileged. It would redress some of the inequities and pay attention to social justice. It would recognize the principle of plurality, a continental approach, importantly also learning from one another and ongoing reflection and reflexivity. Tanya, I think I'm going to leave it at that. But thank you once again for the opportunity of facilitating this first session and of participating in this very important discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rispel. You've done an amazing job of capturing the critical highlights of our conversation, which I think was very fruitful in taking us further in the conversation on decolonizing African health systems and practice. Thank you so much also to our fire lighters, our fire starters for their remarks. That brings us to the end of the program for day one. I hope it's been engaging. I hope you've learned something. I hope you are enticed to come back for day two. In closing, I want to thank the team, Mrs. Philippa, Professor Rispel, Lance, Shenaz, David and Danny, who've been behind the scenes helping us to have a really great conversation today been an honor to hear you and to be in your presence. Go well, lalani gathe, till tomorrow, pamba zwakanaka, au revoir, ademar. We look forward to seeing you in the next two days.